Good morning, everyone. Welcome to each one of you who've joined the class today online, as well as to those who have uh, come in as part of the e-learning portal. We hope that you are um, enjoying classes and uh, you know learning something new every time, and uh, also you know being able to apply it in different ways as you meet people, as you minister to people. Well, that's the <clears throat> whole uh, uh, you know deal of this is that uh, not just this is just not an academic program, but it is something that uh, we learn to minister through. So let's just uh, start with a word of prayer and we'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you have helped each one of us come in for class and um, enjoy what we're learning in whichever quarters, whichever part of the uh, nation or the world we are in. Thank you for these um, methods that we can use to connect to one another, to be able to learn through this mode. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us today, will open our hearts to um, newer attitudes and newer attributes of, of who you want us to be as we share the burden and uh, help others in showing your love and grace. Thank you, God, for um, for all of us who've joined in, even those who are yet to join in. We pray that you will remove every hindrance and uh, bring us all to class so that uh, we can uh, we can do what you have called each one of us to do. Thank you, Master, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> all right. So um, last week we had... Uh, uh, we were looking at uh, a very important part of um, the entire process of counseling, and we were looking at understanding the personality or understanding, having a biblical perspective of what um, our human needs and an understanding of our personalities. And I'm just going to quickly, maybe in five minutes, quick, uh, just quickly run through what we did yesterday, because uh, I think in the last class, someone had asked for like a, a recap. Um, and I had specifically said, you know, if there are certain questions that you'll have, you could, we could answer that in the first maybe 20 minutes, and then get on with our class. So I've, I've kind of kept 20 minutes just for this. Um, so, so just to build up a specific context, context, we looked at how uh, human beings function. We saw that um, scripture teaches us that we are made in the image of God, that we are image bearers of God. So an image, being an image bearer is to mean that we reflect God, that we resemble God. And um, we, we saw that God has bestowed his own likeness upon us as uh, as his creation, uh, as human beings, as his creation. So our understanding of uh, who we are comes from, first of all, knowing who God is, and then understanding how God made us. And in that way, as counselors, we get to know, um, uh, you know, we make, a, we, we develop a theory of personality just by understanding who God is, his nature, his purposes, and how he has made us to be. So we first look at the nature of God. We saw that God is eternal, he is relational, he is personal, he is perfect, he is powerful. God is a God who has an intellect and a will and an emotional, and that's what makes him relational. And the way that he has revealed himself through to us is through the word uh, and through the person of Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. So, and we did look at further into that we get our image of God from uh, scripture, uh, from our personal prayer life, from the word, from the Holy Spirit, from teaching that we have received, even that which has been modeled to us by our parents. So we saw that man is made in God's image, and we need to gain an understanding of that in order to, to know how to um, deal with the problems man comes with. So when we do understand man, there were three 
uh, core concepts that we looked at that um, uh, man is a free moral agent and they have the right to make choices but however do not have the right to choose a consequence we looked at how there is eternity that is placed in the heart of every man and that man is an eternal being and after the judgment there exists either eternal uh, eternal life or uh, eternal death um, and the third the, the main concept we looked at was that god has given us the given us human beings or man the right to choose uh, even our eternal destiny and uh, we he's given us the will to choose that okay so then we we focused on knowing that um uh, uh, when god made us in the image there were certain attributes that he gave unto us the attribute of being perfectly loved being perfectly secure loved or valued being perfectly secure and being perfectly significant and having purpose and this was something that was inherently there in adam and eve before the fall so after the fall sin changed the old Uh, the whole thing where we still bore the image of god we were made with dignity we had the dignity of bearing the image but yet we were depraved because of sin and so we still have the capacity for that security and significance and worth but we have no way of satisfying it and as a result there are uh, things we we it becomes needs these these three attributes that were in, inherently ours become needs and we look all around for satisfying that um we also looked at uh, in that context is when we looked at uh, the casual needs the critical needs and the crucial needs we saw that the casual needs were needs that really didn't make much of an impact if it were fulfilled or not the critical needs were those that did cause a sense of despair um and was impairing uh, would bring us to despair if if there was an impairment in those areas and some of the examples we looked at was if there was a loss of a relationship if there's a loss of a job if there is a, a significant physical health all of that becomes critical needs and then we looked at the most crucial needs being the need of self worth the need of um, uh, feeling um, secure and the need for significance or having purpose uh, and we we did see that the path of maturity at the end of the lesson we looked at the path of maturity being um having our most crit- uh, crucial needs met and then the critical and the casual needs do come up um, you know on uh, uh, comes as a result just like scripture says um, you know seek ye first the kingdom of god and all these things will be added unto you so the so when we do find the source of having those critical needs met in god the rest of the things those crucial and casual needs become uh, come as a part and parcel of of uh, having those needs met now while understanding a human being we looked at those five areas of functioning which uh, is something that we need to focus on even as we are helping to uh, to bringing about in counseling so these five areas of of functioning we we spoke about is the spiritual being where um, that that is the place where it has a deep yearning for a close and intimate relationship with god and that's where the part of the crucial needs lie we looked at the rational being where man has the ability to reason and understand and comprehend and uh, <clears throat> and for, for a counselor to be able to help the counselee to focus on the rational part of their functioning we looked at the emotional being uh, we said uh, the emotional being was um, uh, is what really decides whether life becomes meaningful or you know difficult and a counselor who needs to pay attention to that because um you know and, and just not focus only on the behavioral aspects of human functioning because emotions do play a large part in the way one one would behave <clears throat> the fourth area we looked at was volitional the uh, ability for a man to make choices to make personal choices and we understood that when we have wrong beliefs and when we have wrong goals is when one would make a wrong choice so if we don't understand that a person is a choosing being 
we fail to help the person take that responsibility to make that the choice and lastly we we looked at us being physical beings where we have a frame in which all of this is um, housed and it is a vital component in contributing also to a person's uh, issue or, or a problem so we <clears throat> we looked at these convictions that um, the main convictions that we have are that people are made in the image of God with these five areas of functioning. Sin has marred and distorted that image. And what we do in counseling is working with God to restore that image so that their crucial needs are met in God. The, these, these needs of love, of um, um, security and belonging and uh, um, significance and, and purpose are met in God, thereby they restore that image as to what they were created and are able to deal with what their concerns or their issues are. So this is very quickly in a five minute nutshell of uh, you know what we had focused on the last time. So I'm just going to open it up just for 10 minutes to <clears throat> Uh, for you, you know, I'm sure you'll have thought over these things that we had spoken about and, and studied last time and uh, just opening it up for questions if there are any. Yes, Samuel, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you, Pastor. Um, so, um, I, so, Pastor, while you know, thinking of this, uh, the for me, I think um, something that I'm I don't feel so confident about is, um, you know, while trying to counsel now, having known that, uh, so having these convictions or even uh, this theory that that we are what we are. Uh, Like because uh, some some need is not met, so so I, I'm 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 in this mess because there was a need that I was trying to fulfill, uh, but I obviously resort, resort resorted to incorrect means, which has landed me in this mess. Um, so 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 as a counselor, I think I'm so I have I I'm probably walking in with this assumption about my counseling, like. This person is here because, um, you know, at the end of it, because there's a need that this person is trying to fulfill, but it's not being met, that need. And so I'm, so probably I'm thinking the journey that I would take as a counselor would be to identify what that need is. Uh, and so so that's the part where I don't feel confident about. So, so I'm starting off with an assumption. Um, and uh, what if... Uh, you know, what if that assumption is incorrect about this person that I make? Like, you know, what if it's not a need? So, 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 so I think it then comes down to like, uh, would there be people who would be in a mess, uh, but not because of them trying to fulfill any need, but for some other reasons? Okay. So that, that's a good question, Samuel. I think, and I think I'd like to probably ask you is that think of any kind of an issue that, that you may have personally had and look back and try and maybe just do a quick analysis of why you feel the way that you do in a certain situation. Like, for example, maybe very simple uh, examples of yeah, maybe in a relationship, you are in a relationship with maybe your spouse or a, or a parent or a child, and they don't do what you say, or they don't see sense into what you say. What do you think would be the core feeling that erupts in you, in you, not in the other person, in you? Samuel? Sorry. Yeah. This, could you, uh, I mean, one more time, I, I think, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you're having uh, an issue with, a, with some significant person in your life, maybe your spouse or your child or your parent, okay? And you all are having a conversation and this person does not see any sense in what you're saying. They're saying, 
you know, what you're saying is absolutely wrong. Maybe you're discussing about something and you're saying, no, what you've said is absolutely wrong. I just don't trust that what, you know, your understanding is right on this. Right. What, what does it evoke in you? About yourself, not about the relationship or the other person. What does it evoke in you? I think uh, multiple things. Like one is, I mean, dep depending on uh, so so many factors. Uh, but I I do. I'm I'm, I'm learning to check myself. Uh, but depending on if I'm tired, how hungry I am, all of that. So if, <laughs> yeah. So depending. Okay. But if I'm if so I'm if if I'm um, like, but if I am um, like, if I have a check and if I'm you know and I'm I'm more conscious and aware of my physical being I, I think these days I'm trying to um, trying to see for myself like why am I not being able to to convey what I want to convey like I, I'm, I'm trying to help or say so I'm trying to say something but I'm not being able to show my perspective my my point of view correctly and uh, and 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 I also I'm doing a lot of introspection maybe I'm uh, so maybe I'm not understanding my spouse or you know, okay. properly. So I, I don't understand uh, their, maybe I don't understand where they are coming from. So I, I try to do that. But if I'm, if I'm tired, I'll that I just like, okay, let's, I mean, I, I think I yeah, I'll become more snappy or something. Okay. So that's exactly what, you know, what we learned. It's like peeling an onion. So what are you doing is when someone comes to you with an issue, you're actually peeling them, like an onion. So you first look at whether there has been any physical aspects that has caused what they're feeling. Okay, are you hungry? Are you tired? Do you have, you know, are there hormonal issues? Are you sick? Okay, so you get that out of the way. Then comes your next part of it would be your emotional being. Are your emotions uh, playing a big role in the way that you're understanding this entire thing? Has this, have you been able to really express what you are going through? You know, sometimes when you're just able to express and you're very settled with, you know, if I'm able to express probably with the person I'm upset with that I'm upset with them, once I'm done that, you know, I have settled. So you, you've got that out of the way. Then comes your rational being. Uh, is it my thoughts that's, uh, you know, that that's been uh, wrongly, I've, I've been having wrong thoughts. Have I been thinking about this entire situation differently? Am I thinking negatively about the person? Am I thinking negatively about the suggestion that they've made? Then comes your volitional being about the way that you're making choices. I, uh, you know, is there a sense of stubbornness that you come in? So you've peeled it up to there and then comes the last part of, you know, if you've kind of managed to figure out, okay, that it doesn't seem to be any of these. The last part that I come to is the spiritual being, which is that place of crucial, crucial uh, needs where I say, okay, am I just being, uh, do, do I feel um, undervalued? Do I feel as if my spouse doesn't care about what I have to say? Or, uh, you know, do I feel that I'm not respected? So it, it may boil down to this. I don't mean to say that all situations may have this need, but when you're looking at major concerns, you know, people having struggles over and over again, let's say for those who are into promiscuous relationships, those who are into significant addictions, those who may be having a significant anxiety or depression, you know, or issues with anger, you begin to see that there is a pattern that follows. And, and unless you as a counselor are able to figure out all these pathways, these five areas of functioning, coming down finally to that place of spiritual functioning, those crucial needs of it, you know, that's, that's the pathway. And that's what you're looking at, you know. So maybe uh, someone who's just come to you with a thyroid issue and they're feeling depressed and you give them some medication on thyroid and they're perfectly okay. Great. Those needs, I mean, those, so that's what I meant to, what, what we were talking about is that areas of functioning is so important to understand. But when we're looking at the personality as a whole, we see that needs, there are these needs that are universal to all of us. And uh, you you ask anybody, you know, what would what what would their strongest need be? Would be one would be to you know I want to be loved, I want to be cared for, I want to know that I'm I belong to somebody, I need to know that I can function as an individual. Those are the core things that God Himself has put into us. So yes, mm. I agree. Maybe that's not not all cases you may have the need, but this is what the pathway needs to be, where you're you're actually finding that out. 
Does that make it more clear, Samuel? It it does, pass. It does. Um, is this the the? I mean, uh, so I get the areas to explore, but uh, but essentially, I'm still looking for the need. I'm I'm trying to figure out what need is being, uh, what need is being tried to fulfill in what not, area. Not be not being met. Yeah. Not being met in what area, mm. and and you that's. Know, as as you as you help the now you may have an understanding you may think okay i think this person needs to be loved and that's why so that's your first judgment but it's only as you continue to explore and understand where they are at that you will begin it becomes more clearer for you and through your questioning through your skills of counseling you're also able to help them see hey this is what i really want you mm -hmm. know, and it, it may not be very clear initially for either you or for the person, but the more that you explore, you know, what makes you get into these relationships, what makes you feel the way that you do, that's what really evokes this understanding, not just in them, but also in you. So it is a journey. It is something that, you know, it's a process of finding out. But mm. the understanding is that if we have been motivated to go pick something or to go after something, there is definitely some need in us that we are attempting to fulfill. So that's mm. the premise of this. And the premise of the gospel that, you know, we're, uh, after sin, you are looking for something to fulfill a gap that you are you're feeling that vacuum that you're feeling and until and unless you actually have that true relationship with god you're on the run you're on you're actually still searching people are searching for truth what is that truth you know? and that's that's the need something that is not being met is what they're searching for and which can be met in in the gospel, which can be met in a relationship with Jesus, because that's what he gives. He endows those attributes back to us when we are in that right relationship with him. Thank you. Thank you. Keep thinking, keep thinking yes. about it, Sam. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Christopher, can I take your question? Christopher? Ah, yes, yes, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, so for, um, I actually have um, uh, one observation and I just wanted some clarity on that. And the other one is a question. Uh, so the first one uh, with regards to the observation is just while I was going and reading through the through the notes, I um, I saw that uh, there is, you know, when, we, when I was looking at page number 10, uh, the five areas of human functioning, so that's where it is actually initially referred to. And um, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand the flow of it so that, you know, when I'm re reading through it, uh, I'm able to get the most out of the, um, you know, out of, out of the content. So uh, there's a f there are the five functions, um, uh, five areas of human functioning are there. And then, um, then it follows by the three kinds of needs. And then again, there's another reference to the um, those five functions. Mm. And uh, here I see is there are, there are some biblical references for all of them except for emotional. So the emotional area doesn't seem to have any biblical uh, references. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then again, um, this is referred to in the uh, this uh, in page number thirteen. 13. So I just wanted to understand the flow of it and how you know how how this would actually you know um, help us to uh, to get the most out of, out of the content. So that's the observation, and uh, okay. I just want to get some clarity on that. Uh, sure. The question is actually that, that I have is actually you know just coming back to the uh, you know right at right the beginning where you mentioned about um, human beings being uh, depraved, and um, yeah, I mean I <laughs> it's, it's, to me that uh, initially it seemed a very strong word, uh, you know, depraved, because that sort of you know translates to extremely evil and uh, you know, someone who is um, just, uh, you know, beyond uh, goodness. So um, my question is actually around um, the, the you know, I understand that, you know, with, with, with Christ, we are able to save ourselves and when we accept him. But um, what about those who are the unbelievers and uh, people who are from other, other religions? Um, uh, 
So we still, I mean, when we do count, when we counsel them, do we still sort of go in with this approach of, you know, being totally, for them, for them being totally depraved? And then um, knowing that, that uh, you know, Christ is not, um, not really a, a, a means for them to accept, um, at least, you know, in, in the initial counseling session. So I just want to understand what is the approach that one would one use, uh, you know, when, um, when counseling a, a, a non-believer. Okay, so let me just answer your first question. So the first, the, so, so I think your confusion was uh, there are three uh, references made to this human functioning. So what you find on page 10 is an introduction of these areas of functioning, the spiritual being, the rational being, the emotional, the volitional, and the physical being, okay? Then comes the second part of it, which gives you a reference of what the word of God sees it, how these areas of functioning is seen through the light of the word of God. And you have specific scriptures that are put there. Uh, there are scriptures for emotional being, uh, Christopher. There's Deuteronomy 6, 5, Proverbs 4, 23, Hebrews 4, 15. It is there. Uh, I don't know how you have missed that in your notes. It is, it's there. All references of these, of the beings are there in that second portion of it. The third part of it is looking uh, of, of how you understand problems that develop in the, uh, in the human personality and examining these areas of functioning in the way that you understand them. So, so it talks about how everyone has spiritual needs. Everyone are rational beings. Everyone are volitional beings. So it gives you an understanding of looking at uh, being able to find out what goes wrong in these different um, five areas that, you know, in emotional beings, there are sometimes signal emotions that create wrong goals. In the rational being, there is there is a wrong thoughts that creates um, a wrong behavior. Volitional is you make wrong choices. Uh, that that get into wrong behavior and spiritual is is there are uh, the crucial needs that are not met that leads you into false behavior. So this is how it's just been uh, been kind of apportioned for better reading and better understanding. I, I'm sorry if there was a confusion. I, I will I'll definitely look through it and uh, review it again to make the flow a little bit more understandable. Okay. The second part of your question that you said about being depraved, scripture talks about how um, it, it says in Romans uh, 6, 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there is no one who is righteous. That means every one of us, not just those who believe in God, but those who do not believe in God. Um, if you look at another verse in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. So, and, and the only one who can search the heart is, law, is the Lord. And, and it says in that verse that follows it, I, the Lord, search the heart. I examine the mind to reward a man according to his way by what his uh, deeds deserve. So when we look at man, um, we, we understand that man is sinful. And the only way that uh, because of sin, the only thing that we deserve is death. Uh, the wages of sin is death, right? Uh, I think that's Romans 6, 23, if I'm not mistaken. So apologies if that's the wrong reference. So um, uh, the wages of sin is death. And only if, and everything else that you have outside of that is only the grace of God. And the grace of God is there for all his children, whether you're a believer or whether you're an unbeliever. Okay, but for those who believe him, there is his promises, there is his spiritual blessings that he gives unto us. Okay, and that's what makes a believer's life journey a lot more fulfilling. Now, looking at how do we counsel non believers <clears throat> to understand that everyone is blinded from the truth of 
of God and his word. And as, as believers, we are responsible to open God's truth to them. And how do we do this in different ways? You know, it's through evangelization. It's 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 through the way that um, you know you may be meeting with friends, talking to them about your testimony. It may be as part of counseling, as a part of self disclosure, where the counselor themselves comes about and talks about what has been important in their lives, or it is a sharing of the gospel, right? Or it can also be just, which is part of what we're going to be looking at today in today's class, is the relationship that a counselor shares with the counseling. Just seeing the, the sense of acceptance and love and regard that the counselor gives the counselee definitely has a place for them to question what is the driving force but behind the counselor's joy of counselor's um, you know presence in all of this so there are multiple things that brings a person to to a place of understanding now even as i'm saying this there are many people who may shun or may not want to get in to the realm of spirituality now having said that remember that is a choice that they make that is, a, that is a decision that they have taken not to do so. And, you know, God has taught us to be respectful of, of that. If they've decided that, what is it that I'm left with is a place of intercession and prayer for them. That, they, that God would open their eyes, that the scales of their eyes would fall off, that, that, the, that the Spirit would enlighten them into understanding the truth. So even as... Um, even as you are helping non-believers, you may go through this pathway of uh, finally coming to a place of knowing that their crucial needs are unmet. And I've had many number of counselees coming to that place of understanding that, you know, I'm, I feel a lack of value. I feel a lack of self-worth. I don't feel significant. Now, where am I going to find it? So that so that I won't say always, but there are times that gives me the opportunities. It depends on the setting that I'm in now. I'm also part of some corporate counsel counseling that really, you know, does not, because they know I'm a Christian counselor, they, they actually bring that out. And I respect that part of it. So I do, I am careful in the way that I present it. But then I do say, I do give these options. And I say, you know, one way people f have these needs met is when, when they have a spiritual understanding of who God really is. Is that something that you think you should explore? Is that an area that you think you would like to look at? So they may say yes, they may say no, with permission, with, with you know, tactfully sometimes dealing with it. There are parts of the gospel that I open up. But then if there is a, a, a total... Um, uh, you know, unwillingness, then I do respect that. And I say, okay, then, then we may need to look at the second part of it as to how you think you can fulfill this and that the ball is thrown back into their court as to what is it that they can do to fulfill those core and crucial needs that may be present within them. So as when you look at an unbeliever, you definitely have the same frame of understanding uh, as you would when you're dealing with a believer. Only thing is in, in a believer, there is a lot more openness and uh, it's much easier to help them see that, you know, you don't have to run after these needs on your own. You've got someone who's already fulfilled this for you. It's much, much easier, much harder when it comes to comes to an unbeliever who is willing to to pay that, to pay the attention to that. So yes, it's a journey, but nevertheless, I, you know, I believe that it's like a seed that is sown that maybe I've probably put the first or the second seed and somebody would take over in, in really showing them the gospel and then they're able to, to, to come back to it. Because I know a couple of counselees where I've put in the seed, you know, I've, I've thrown in the seed and, and they've gone saying, you know, that that's a very helpful understanding. Now it is my journey to find that, you know, even though we've given those uh, of, of how it can be found in a spiritual relationship with, with God, that, ha that, has been, that has been put, but not really been taken. But then you put in there as a seed and, and believing that, you know, God will use somebody else to water that. 
I, I hope I answered, Christopher. Ah, yes, yes. Thank you. I, 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 I saw that. I saw the Bible references to to, to the emotional okay. function also. Okay. I think I got a little bit for like just reading the document. I saw that emotional area, and I didn't see any Bible references be, uh, underneath that. So I, okay. I, I thought that there was nothing in that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just one, uh, I guess, just one small little question around what you just now mentioned. Um, with with un, with unbelievers, when we throw in, uh, not throw, not throw in, but when we include the spiritual, um, uh, you know, uh, aspect uh, of um, of you know how uh, that is that is that is the only uh, solution uh, or the only pathway to you know to getting. Uh, getting out of certain, uh, you know, um, areas of, um, you know, um, you know, de depravity or uh, you know, areas where you know they are not functioning in goodness. Um, what if they were to bring in, you know, their um, their uh, you know religious beliefs, and uh, when we know that there is only one way, to, and there is only one God, and you know that is uh, that is uh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And uh, they bring in their, uh, and they say that you know, yes, we do it, but we you know we do it through our, our God, and we do it through our uh, our uh, you know the way to uh, you know the, how we have been brought up or whatever. So, um, I've, I've personally not had an experience like this, but what I would think is the wisest thing to do is um, you know one is invite them to church and say. Uh, you know, why would would you like to probably uh, understand what this part of spirituality that maybe uh, maybe what a Christian believer thinks about? Would you like to explore that? And then you know, do your own search about what you believe in. Try and find. I think what you should do is to help them to find those results on themselves, or put them to sources, put them to people who would be able to do that um, that kind of a distinguishing thing for them, or maybe sending them a video to understand what's the difference between a belief of a Christian God and a belief in something else. You know, I, I think that becomes more helpful because I, I, I'll tell you in the context that sometimes I work in, maybe that part of it may not be something in the purview that I'm called to do. Like, like for example, maybe in, in a corporate setting, I'm called to do a specific role. And I would be careful in how I help the person. So I, I think I would tactfully, wisely use it to put them on to another source who could help them to find more or maybe give them a book to read or, or something that helps to um, get them to understand this in totality but let's say if it's if it's a setting like 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 what we have in a center like ours in a counseling center like us which is completely christian then maybe i would get into some form of a discussion with them to as much as i would be able to or put them again on to maybe maybe uh, somebody like pastor or someone who can who can really help them to decipher that so that's what i would do because i i think i would also look at what is it that i am able to bring to the table for them and maybe things that i don't completely understand is something that i may source out and it is perfectly fine to source out something that you you feel you may not be confident in but I, I think that's necessary to do. One is to get them to research on their own, to give them good resources to uh, find this out and to uh, put them on to someone who could probably have an independent discussion of this because you're dealing a lot with maybe emotional issues and struggles with that, right? And, and sometimes you want to help the individual to keeping at that and having this seen somewhere else because i've heard a lot of times that um, you know once you build a bias on a counselor then you you've completely lost them out so I, I would be very careful and wisely tactfully do that to ensure you know if i know my counselee well enough maybe those discussions I, I may get into if not um i i would probably source it out outside thank you okay 
All right. Okay. Um, so, oh God, okay. We've taken 40 minutes on that. All right. So we're going to uh, dwell into our, uh, our next topic and our next uh, topic is on the uh, counseling process and part of the counseling process is the counseling relationship and we're going to be looking at page 15 onwards um, and we, we're going to specifically look at certain components that are needed in a counseling um, uh, relationship. Uh, kindly give me a minute I'll just share my screen so that uh, yeah uh, I hope you can see my screen right yeah Okay, so we're going to be looking at um, the counseling process and one part of that counseling process is the counseling relationship. Now, a counseling relationship refers to counseling or, you know, in the secular parlance, it's called as a therapeutic relationship, okay? Um, and uh, it this refers to the close and consistent association that exists between two individuals, which is the counselor as well as the counselee. Now, the purpose of the relationship is to help the counselee to bring about a change in his or her life. And this relationship is essential because very often uh, the, this could be the first setting in which this person, the counselee, shares these intimate thoughts and beliefs and emotions regarding whatever they have come for. So, uh, so, so it becomes very important that the counsellor provides a very safe, open, non-judgmental atmosphere where the counsellee can be at complete ease. So the, the, uh, uh, a good uh, cushioning is where you're able to build trust, you're able to build respect, and you're encouraged to show certain attitudes um, and just like how you would do in any other social relationship, uh, these are certain things that are important. Now, when you look at the counselor, uh, the counselor, sorry, the counselee comes with maybe certain insight is, you know, you're looking for them to be honest, you're looking for them to be persistent, you're looking for them to bring about a motivation to change. All of this comes when the counselee builds certain attitudes, okay? And we're going to be looking significantly at this. So just a few definitions uh, to understand why a counseling relationship is important. Um, uh, so so these, these are just taken from, uh, uh, you know, some um, uh, counselors who've, who've been in the, in the field and who've, who've uh, really researched about the counseling relationship. Now, the relationship between a counsellor and the counsellee is something that should be built by trust and openness. In this one-on-one -on -one relation, relationship, where the counsellee is helped to work through these problems and crises that they may be coming from so that they can find options in their life also and be able to discover what God has put into their lives. Okay? A counselling relationship becomes effective when uh, when the counselor's personal qualities and skills are there to encourage growth in the counseling. So so a lot of a lot of help comes from what the counselor's qualities and skills are. okay? So remember these are all in the background of what we learned in the first um, lesson where yes, God is the center, the Holy Spirit is the one who opens up um, thoughts and ideas and understanding. Uh, and you as a counselor is an important medium in this process. So God needs to use you effectively as a counselor to be able to help and reach the other person. Okay. So the goal or the task of the counselor is to provide a relationship that allows the other person to discover within themselves the areas of growth and a way of thinking and active. So that's that's what you are called to do, to help them to change the way they may be thinking, change the way may, they may be behaving so that growth can occur. And how is this done? This is done through specifically core attitudes of a therapist or a, or a counselor rather than whatever approach you are using 
um, in counseling. Okay, so more than the approach, like there are very many different approaches that one would use, you know, in, in a counseling setting, especially when you've, you've done count, uh, secular counseling, there are very many theories. I mean, people go through different approaches, like, you know, one is the psychoanalytical approach where they go back into the childhood and figure out things uh, that impact the present. There, <clears throat> there is the client-centered, where you're looking at the individual then and there, there is the solution focus. So there are many, many uh, orientations, but what what is more important is the attitude of the counselor. And this attitude, the way that the counselee perceives this attitude makes a huge difference in the counselee also. So let's just look at what these components, uh, components are. There, there are three specific components that we are going to be looking at, and they are bedrock in building the foundation of a counseling relationship. So the first is empathy. The second is unconditional positive regard. And the third is congruence or something that is called this genuineness. And we will look into detail to each, each of this just to understand and explain what uh, each of this mean. So the first one we're looking into is called <clears throat> empathy. Okay, now what is, uh, so so maybe, uh, you know, just, just for an understanding that we have, uh, I'm sure as a, you know, as kids, uh, or even as, uh, uh, as adults, we've played this, uh, you know, you, you play this game where you give four feet to one another, right? Like you, in, in, you know, you, you're, you're, you're supposed to choose a partner and you're supposed to write something that they should do in public right or they should do in front of your class or things like that uh, have any of you played that in some way or the other you know you're you're supposed to write a feat for the other person have any of you played that no okay i guess not no all right okay uh, so if we were if we were in in real class i would have actually got you all to play that uh, so maybe yeah, okay, truth or dare? Okay, okay, something like truth or dare, right? Okay, uh, so I'm sure you'll have played truth or dare. So if you were to ask somebody to do something, what do you think you would ask them to do? And I'd like to hear some responses. Let's say maybe in the classroom, you want someone to do something, okay? We're having a fun time, okay? So what would you ask somebody to do or somebody to share? Or... Okay. So Samuel said, dance, sing. What else would you do? Dance and sing is really simple. Isn't it? Act like a monkey. <laughs> OK. All right. Now, OK, so great. Share a secret. OK. So what, what we are doing now, what is, what is empathy? Um, so generally, if I were in actual class, and let's say, uh, OK, let's say, you know, I've paired up Samuel and Anita together. So Samuel has told, has asked Anita to act like a monkey. And Anita has asked Samuel to share a secret. So what I would do to really bring about the concept of empathy is have Samuel do what he's asked Anita to do. So I would ask Samuel to act like a monkey and Anita to share a secret. Samuel, possible to act like a monkey and give us some entertainment? <laughs> OK. All right. OK. Now, why is this important is that um, often when, like in this game, when I give a feat or I ask someone to do something, I don't really care how they're going to do it. All that I want to do is put them in an uncomfortable position so that everybody else has a laugh, right? I mean, this is a game, but that's the, that's the very core of it. But to be perceptive and sensitive that, hey, if I ask Anita to act like a monkey, you know, how is that going to be for her? What if I were in her position? Would I like to do that? Maybe not. Maybe I will try something else, right? So... Uh, this is just to bring about a point about about empathy for us to you know really understand so what is empathy empathy 
can be def uh, described in very many different ways. And some of it is what I've written here. You know, you walk in another's shoes, you enter into another's frame of reference. This frame of reference is, is a class we're going to take the next time. So that's something I will go into a lot more detail. Or having the ability of uh, ability to experience life as the other person has, or by entering into their own world of thoughts and emotions and uh, understanding. So that that's what empathy empathy means. Now in counseling, what um, what empathy is an expression of the regard and respect you as a counselor holds for the counselee, whose experience may be very different from yours as a counselor. So the counselee needs to feel held or understood well, as well as feel respected. Now to hold a client, uh, uh, a counselee uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a relationship, in a therapeutic relationship, relationship means that the counselor is capable to accept and support the counselee through any issues or problems or concerns that they may bring. It's the ability to empathize with another. And it is, and what this does is it enhances your attentiveness. And you do that by different expressions. Okay. Whereas sympathy, now uh, often, you know, we, we get mixed up with, the, with these two words, empathy and sympathy. Sympathy, on the other hand, is not empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. It is to create sorrow in yourself in response to what the other person may be going through. So when you feel sympathy for someone, you might also see them with pity. While, you know, pity makes people like a victim, makes a victim of the sufferer. You say, poor thing, poor you. You're actually making a victim of the, uh, of the person. Whereas empathy empowers them and is saying, you know, I have an understanding of what your world is. You're not alone. You and I are here in this together. So the important elements of empathy is to be able to understand the feelings of, of the other. Oh, sorry, let me get on to the next slide. Yeah, so the em empathy becomes as a skill. It, it, it is seen as a skill that, that, you, that you, you build up, okay? Now, it's, it's the skill of reflecting back to another person. So you recognize and you reflect back, you share back the feelings that you see the person is experiencing. You're actually looking and saying, okay, what, what is this person feeling? And empathy is to be able to reflect back what the other person may be feeling. It also involves listening to, to others, understanding them, and communicating this understanding back. Okay, it's listening. It's understanding and communicating this understanding back. So empathy is the capacity to recognize and to some extent share these feelings that, that the other person has experienced to the other. So you understand the feeling, you reflect the, the counselee's mood and the content, and it is done through your tone of voice, which conveys that ability to share these feelings. So finally, uh, only when you can really be open or clear or sensitive to the emotions and feelings of the other person does actual care begin to happen. Okay. And that happens when you empathize. Okay. Sorry. I'm just a little cognizant of time. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think we'll, before we get into this, uh, we'll, we'll probably take a break. And uh, so on my clock, it's 10.54. Uh, let's uh, resume back at 11.04 after a cup of coffee. So come back uh, to understand more, right? <clears throat> 